To understand the Renaissance, we started looking at Florence as the cradle of the Renaissance. Look closely at this artwork. Look at how the city center of Florence is ringed by a defensive wall that is common of all medieval cities, except the one we're about to look at. We also talked about Rome as the epicenter for large-scale monumental artistic achievements sponsored by the popes, including Pope Julius, who was remaking the city himself as a grand monument. But there was yet a third Italian hotspot for Renaissance art, the city of Venice. It had a different character than Florence or Rome, including its own artistic tradition and style. Bellini, the Venetian painter Bellini, shows that here in his 1496 painting, The Procession of the True Cross. He's depicting the citizens of the Venetian Republic, for it was a republic like Florence, gathered together for a religious ceremony in front of the city's main cathedral and their main public square, the Cathedral of San Marco, the Piazza San Marco. Note that the architecture of the cathedral here is quite different than Brunelleschi's classicizing structures. Yes, it has arches, but it mostly has grand domes and complex layers of golden mosaics. Venice was deeply engaged with with Byzantine and Eastern Mediterranean influences. Because Venice was a seaport, a major sea trading center between the Eastern and the Western Mediterranean. So Venice as a place is very different, different from Rome or Florence. Rome was founded as a capital by the ancient Romans around 500 BCE. And the ancient Romans left their artistic and architectural mark on the mainland, the center of Italy from that time onward. Venice was perhaps founded in the fifth century CE, so a thousand years later, by people fleeing mainland Italy to escape attackers. They built a city on mud flats and islands, among lagoons and waterways. They built a city of bridges and boats. As a major trading center between East and West, Venice was a multicultural city. This 15th century painting by Carpaccio demonstrates that rich cosmopolitanism. The scene juxtaposes two spheres of activity, a religious miracle and the hustle and bustle of commercial activity around the famous Rialto Bridge. The crowd is full of different kinds of people. Venetians wear red and black togas following the sartorial rules of their Republican city. In the far left, we see the Armenians, or Turks, wear tall black hats. Moving deeper into the pictorial space, we can see that the Arabic or Turkish traders can be identified by their turbans. And then here on the water, we see the gondoliers, including a dark-skinned man of African heritage. His high fashion garment, check out those tights, suggests that he may possibly be a freed ex-slave. The gondoliers, the taxicab drivers of Venice, are transporting all sorts of different kinds of people, including this Venetian man with his marvelous dog. Stepping back from the painting's content, its subject matter, what it shows, we can see some elements of Venetian style. For one, Venetian painters like Carpaccio used oil on canvas, not water-based pigments or egg-based pigments on panel. We've seen oil paint on wood panels, Jan van Eyck, but that's different than canvas. Canvas as a fabric has some expansion and contraction. With oil paint in Venice, it was found that, first of all, fresco didn't work well in Venice because of all that water going under all those bridges right up to the houses. 
So there's too much moisture for fresco. It'll flake off the wall. You can use oil paint, but it doesn't work to use it smoothly on panel. You need it on canvas. And so there's a different style, a different handling of the oil paint, a kind of softer wet into wet that emphasizes color and emphasizes light. Look at the light above Carpaccio's city skyline, the, the light of the sky, the clouds. So light is something you notice in a world of water and reflections. At the same time, there's a very much an interest in kind of the ordinary stuff of everyday life, like these wonderful chimneys that were the typical inverted cone shape chimneys of Venice, Venice's public buildings, public spaces. So Venice's artistic tradition is shaped by the fact of water and light, by its location and the kind of special magic of the city on the sea. It's a, a, the place where oil paint on canvas first becomes a significant mode of art making. And by the 19th century, that's going to be the primary form of painting in Western Europe. But there's another thing to talk about, the eyewitness style. This is a phrase that is used for art like Carpaccio's um, view of the Rialto Bridge and here Bellini's procession in front of San Marco, where you feel like you're there because although the space is organized very effectively, the the perspective works quite well. You see the increasing, diminishing size of forms as they go back. You really believe there's a deep space. It's not all lined up in an ideal, harmonious, and mathematical way. It's not like the Stanza della Signatura, where all of the bodies are arranged around a kind of central point in an elegant, and graceful way. There's a kind of provisional quality of everyday life. Some things are cut off to the side. The way you, as a bystander, and I witness someone walking by, you turn your head, you catch a glimpse of that, you catch a glimpse of that. The artist is not editing out the, the kind of um, movement or ordinary awkwardness of everyday life. So, there's a way in which Venetian painting is not as caught up in a perfect idealism. And that will be interesting for how this set of Venetian stylistic elements will bring forth a new kind of artwork, the easel painting for the discerning collector that is a major step toward the world of modern art.